Ghostman Horror Host here. Ghost of Christmas Past by Jack Rollins. Bloody hell, Teddy roared, flinging the cushions across the sofa. He glanced at the clock on the mantelpiece and tried to calculate how long he spent searching for his keys. Rubbing a hand over his thin grey hair, he turned his head, scanning the room, trying to spot a hiding place for the mischievous little bastards. He glanced at the clock again. There was something to go to. Something he needed to hurry up and get to. It's ten o'clock, he thought cheerfully. Time for a cuppa. He rinsed out his mug, shuffled to the fridge, opened it and reached for the milk, but it was gone. Where the, the bloody milk is? The hell is the milk, he mum, mum, muttered. He found it almost immediately. There on the table next to two bowls, one bowl of soggy cereal, another empty. Having already, already been eaten, the scene was all at once familiar and alien to him. Elsie muttered, staring at the full bowl. Can't be, thought Elsie's gone. How long has it been? Next to the empty bowl set the keys he had spent all the time searching for. Here, yeah, all along, well, Elsie, you played trick me again, did old girl. Teddy had been taken to doing this. That since Elsie's death. He was lonely. He filled the silences. Not a full conversations, but the odd words here and there, just in case she happened to be watching over him. He picked up the keys and turned to admire the view of the garden through the window or the upper half of the back door. This was his view of every meal time. He plodded out to the coat hanger next to the front door and grabbed his thick coat. He pressed his feet again into the dark green Wellington boots and returned to the back, back door. Foaming with the keys, he tried to unlock the door, but the mechanism would not budge. He tried another key, but it did not fit into the keyhole. Bloody thing in my mold. Returning the first key to the lock of athlete back and forth. He snatched to the door handle and the door rex went through, allowing the door to open. It wasn't locked in the first place. He looked back in the seal bowls of seal. Who else had been in there? Someone's let himself in. Someone's been helping themselves to my food. From the corner of Teddy's peripheral vision, he detected movement, just a shift of light and shadow, as if it, as of someone peering at the kitchen door and darting back into the passage once more. Who's there? Teddy cried. He tried to freeze the shadow's shape in his memory, determined to make sense of it. The shape was fast moving, small, about the height of a child. Get back here, you little sod. Probably one of the neighborhood's kids playing a prank. Teddy climbed across the kitchen floor in his Wellington boots, Wellingtons, hoping to catch sight of the little bugger so he could determine which room he was hiding in. No footsteps on the stairs, no doors opening or closing. Teddy reasoned he must be hiding in the lounge and stepped through the doorway to see. He assumed it was a boy. He was chasing girls, tended not to be that, that sort of do this sort of thing. Come out and let and let I'll let you go without telling your parents. If, if you make me trace you, I'll be very close and march you over to your mum. There was no response. Ted Teddy crept along the back of the sofa, trying to peer over the arm at the end closest to the lounge window. But he could not get a clear view from the angle, so he kept stepping forward as quietly as he could, hoping to give the child a good scare that would make them run out of the house and not bother him again. Must be a bloody small boy, he thought, as he got closer to the end of the sofa. I still could not see no sign of the child. He suddenly bent down, leaning over, around the end of the sofa, exclaiming, Got you, you little bugger. But there was nobody there. A door slammed in the passage. It was a clo- it was closed to the front door, with the- but with no letter box flat rattling. It could only be the door to the toilet stored years to save else years ago to save Elsie and him trampling off up those stairs every time they needed a loo. But moments later, Teddy slapped down the palm of his right hand against the locked door. Come out, come out, unlock this door at once. 
He paused, listening to a, a, for a response of some sound. But the little room's occupant, nothing. Come out at once, you little bastard. He snapped, slamming the underside of the, his bull bony fist against the door. Come out now. The front door handle wiggled immediately to his left. Puzzled, he snatched at the back handle and shouted. Got friends coming to terrorise me now, huh? Well, then, not getting in there. At the front door, lock for June. A teddy foot against the force being applied to the door handle from the other side. Get away, you nasty bugger. I've got your friend trapped in here. A familiar face from the outside called to him. Dad, what's going on? Who's in there with you? Tony, Tony released the door handle and stepped out. Carol? Let, let me in, Dad, Carol replied. Okay, I'll, cl- I'll clear the I'll be I'll clear the door. It's one of the neighbors' little bastards in here, trying to frighten me. The front door opened. The cow's face appeared, seized and concerned. Are you sure, Daddy? Trying to turn the door. The sort of shots locked you to in. Carol pressed the door handle down, and the door opened immediately. In the room. Oh, was as suspected, more or less, the toilet, the small basin, occupied the room as they should. But he struck Carol with a dirty streak, skid marks down the toilet bowl, the yellow spatters of dry urine on the white plastic bowl. Toilet bowl. The wash basin was badly in need of clean too, with lines scum and green grime marks coating the porcelain. A gro- growth of mildew around the tap, heads and plug hole. Carol's green eyes moist, like moistened. She turned back to her father, who stood there, stood with his eyebrows raised. Well, who's there in there? Nobody, Daddy. It's empty. Can't be. I was locked down. Look, Dad, Dad we'll talk about it in a minute. Why don't you go and put the kettle on? Carol, somebody's playing silly beggars me, trying to frighten an old man, and I'm not having it. Carol sighed and stepped up to, to him, wrapping her arms around him and giving him a squeeze. Give us a cuddle, Dad. Just calm down. Let's have a nice day, and we'll get our decorations up. I thought we were going to have a lovely time putting the tree up. Christmas tree? I'll see. The kids are all grown up. Carol, Dad, what? Never mind. Anyway, my da- my kids are grown up. Well, I'll never see them, Teddy moaned. Edward McCleary. Carol said, dropping a voice that an octave or two, adopting the role of parent. I have you know that Marley was around on Sunday to see you, and she was there. She was here twice more during the week. I know boys aren't great at dropping by, but I'd, what can I do? Teddy grinned, his eyes narrowing with pride as the thoughts of his mischievous teenage grandsons filled his mind. Chasing the girls, I bet. You're not wrong. Now listen, I'm lucky. I'm not dying of thirst, dear. You stick the kettle on and I'll find that nice Christmas tea. See, dear? All right, Teddy replied, his voice drenched in his mock reluctance. He loved it when Carol got her t- ch- charge head on. He would never admit it, but he always helped him to focus on what needed to be done. In the kitchen, Teddy opened the olive green vintage. Wington's tea tin and dropped two tea bags into the kettle. He pressed down upon the button to start the boil, making sure the little blue LED came out on, as sometimes he had a habit or not of making the button click it into the op back petition. He took a, 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 a two mugs from the little wooden tree, mug, mug tree next to the chrome toaster and turned to find the milk. On the floor, a boy of eight years old, outstretched, breathing bubbles and blood of deep, of blood in deep, rasping gurgles. Ribs poked through his shirt and his left arm and legs were laid twisted about, around on an impossible angle. The child's face was coloured a ghastly blue grey, highlighted with a dark purple welts. Carol raced to the kitchen, hearing her father scream, a clatter of him falling to the floor. His head striking the hand as the kitchen drawers on his way down. She found his, her father laid out unconscious on a cold loneliness, twitching and muttering. She cried out, 
snatched the telephone from the charging stand in the kitchen and called for an ambulance. Sean, I thought you want to know. He's getting out today. Carol said, embracing herself to Sean's reaction to her call. Why, why would you think I care? Sean asked. Though she could not see him, Carol could imagine the impatient, tight-lipped look on her brother's face. That's... Sean, I thought you would want to know he's getting out today, Carol said, bracing herself for Sean's reaction to a call. Why would you think I do even care, Sean asked. Although she did not see him, Carol could imagine the impatient, tight-lipped look on her brother's face. I just thought you may be, well, maybe the kids should see him, and maybe not. I don't want that miserable old bastard having any influence in their lives. Sean, that's not fair. He's an old man. I don't, don't think... He has much left, longer left. I thought he had a stroke, for Christ's sake. Well, thanks. Turns out he didn't hand. So, don't we just deal with the facts instead of what you thought might have happened? Carol gripped the phone ever tighter. Sean, there's no need to take you to take out of me whatever passed between you and him. Shouldn't make it me the villain of the beast just because I still love him even after he drove mum to the great uh, grave he did not we don't know that Sean I bloody well do know it oh Sean he was good enough for mum to stay with him all his years to, to just give it a rest for all we know it was a fight you both had in front of her that finished her love oh so I killed mum now fuck off cow Carol stared at receiver and uttered the belief as though this thing represented a brother and could see her ex expression. A tone Dale tone drone Sean was given. Sean was gone. Carol's husband, Pete, appeared at, at the do kitchen doorway. No joy then. He is so unreasonable, Pete, he hates him. Carol clenched her jaw and tried to keep the tears burning in in her eyes, just but for the efforts to soon overcome fat, hot tears streamed down her lung cheeks. Peter lunged to across the room to be with her instantly. His muscular arms wrapped around her shoulders. He pulled her head into his chest. The fluffy woolen fabric of a jumper grated against his stubble with a series of tiny snags as he nuddles into her neck. He'll come around. He just needs some time to think of it he won't pete he just wants him dead and out of the way and that's it i'm sure it isn't that simple as that peter said rubbing her back smoothly his hands had the rough dry texture common among plasterers but his heart was as soft and warm as almost anyone carol had known i love you pete i love you too little woman carol's back arched, slightly drawing her head away from pete he released his grip she a moment of reality passed, and now she was returning to her usual state of having everything in order and nothing getting to her. She sniffed and wiped the tears from her eyes and cheeks and the heels of her hand. Next came the smile. It was a weak smile to begin with, but Pete knew exactly what would, she would do next, and she did it. She puffed out her cheeks, squeezing her lips tight, and let air escape from the tiny gap while her cheeks deflated. By the time she set her foot in the lounge, her face flushed with tears at first, I began to calm and return to Carol's normal tan complexion. Wow, you got that up, you got that up fast, Carol exclaimed, staring at a tatty Christmas tree. The disproportion of decorations lopsided, and the tree looked so heavy to be on the right, on the right side. White light seemed to very light seemed to favour the right side too. And so half the tree was in darkness. Well, you fuss on with it too much. I didn't have to t take it. Don't 
doesn't have to take all lo- lo- that long. I'm about, I am about to fuss with it again, you lovely, smooth post repeat. But you know, sweet bubble about dressing a Christmas tree, Carol said, chuckling. Bless you for trying, though. I don't feel patronised at all, Pete replied, Pete replied, smiling. He had, after all, thought of a moment he would leave the tree, as it was, I suppose. I should have just put the packaging back in the cardboard then. It may it be a big help, love, a big help, Carol said already began, untangling the tinsel lights. I will I just want it all to be look lovely for him when he gets back, you know. I want I want it to be look just like when Mum was alive. It might just keep his brain, I know. Present, you know. Have they said it's Alzheimer's, Peter uh, Peter asks. No, they haven't diagnosed anything, but I think it's, it is. They only ha- uh, they only this morning ruled out diabetes. They thought it might have been a UTI. He was so hysterical on the world when he went in that he's not that either. I'm no expert, but it's not sounding too good, is it? Pete added. They only say there's only say it's dementia if they know it's absolutely nothing else. I mean, hallucinating. I heard me- people. Can do that at later stages, but haven't he? Haven't, but we wouldn't have noticed him str- struggling sooner. Pete struggled. My uncle had Alzheimer's, and nobody knew until he was quite advanced age. Sage he must have known something was right. He was either hiding it or frightened to talk about it, or whatever. Downstairs in the house, stayed okay. Looked okay. Oh, like you found with your dad's. It's upstairs where all the problems were. Keeping up appearances, Carol said. I can't believe it when, it ca- uh, when I came through. Pete, he's wearing his raincoat and wellies over his pyjamas. He should never go out like that It was if he was well. Tea bags in the kettle. Oh, and all that in the breakfast. Made for your mum. Pete sighed and looked shook his head at the catalogue of symptoms of his bloody father in law's medical decline. Carol turned away from the tree and looked at her husband. For mum, or oh, we've kept him eaten and make him made himself two breakfasts. That worries me. What happens if he does that with his tablets? Jesus, I can't think about it, Pete. Started to scoop up the cardboard and plastic boxes from the bubbles and festive vomits. Are you sure he won't come and stay with us? Can't we just tell him it's all, uh, it's uh, f- for over Christmas? What's what what's that? Then what? Keep him locked in? If it's dementia, which obviously looks like, it's better for for him to be here, where his surroundings are familiar and all of all the possessions are. Fair enough, Peter Q accepted. I just hate the thought of him sleeping here on his own. It sounds like an old teddy bear was really frightened last week. I can't imagine him look like that. I know he's your dad after and all. I've known him a long time. He's a tough old sod. He's the worst one in the world for accepting help, though. Pete, you know what he's like, as stubborn as his daughter. Take a bubble, Carol tutted and sighed. Did you deliberately put this ferry on backwards? I never did, did, did I? I'm sure it was the right way round. Don't say you're getting it too. Oh, Car- Christ, don't say that, Cal. Just take me out to the woods and shoot me if you ever get get that. If I ever get that. Every inch of Tony's body trembled as he walked slowly, gently up to the path towards his front door. Carol and Pete on the other if armed to support him. I wish I could just hurry up. I don't want the neighbours to see him like this, he muttered, wishing that the darkening wind afternoon was a little darker still, to mask from prying eyes. Neither Carol nor Pete spoke. They simply kept moving, concerned, by the tremors boldly vibrating through them from the the arms of their burden. Teddy's eyes snapped into the master's Master's bedroom window, and he stopped in his tracks, no longer seeing to care about the neighbours seeing him. He thought said over him in his embarrassment. What is it, Dad? Carol asked, following the line of his vision. 
trying to assess what concerned him so suddenly. It's nothing, Peril. Carol applied a gentle pressure to her father's arm, urging him to take a step. Let's get inside where it's warm, huh? Okay, Teddy said, just that his heart was not in it. He glanced at the front door and then back to the upstairs window. When Teddy, when Teddy stepped forward again, Pete was not prepared and apologised quickly, shifting his feet to match Carol and Peter's movement. He just kept glancing at the window, too. Teddy had not seen... When Teddy stepped forward again, Pete was not prepared and apologised, quickly shifting his feet to match Teddy in powers of movements. He kept glancing at the window too. Teddy said, not said it, but Pete knew he, that the old man has got the old man seen. He noticed her shapes moving between the vertical lines too. Every inch of Teddy's body trembled as he walked slowly, gently up the bar. He kept glancing at the window too. Teddy, he said, not to say, say who said it, but Pete thought he knew a man had seen. He noticed a shape moving between the vertical drawings too. Once inside, Carol took his father's coat and prepared his slippers. He unfastened his shoes and took them off. Thanks, Carol, he said, speaking quietly, as though afraid not to disturb someone. Perhaps someone asleep in the house. I'll get the kettle on, huh? Get us all a hot drink, Pete offered. Bert desperate have a moment alone to gather his thoughts. Wait one second, Dad, Carol said. Pulling up her finger, a playful, happy look across her face. She slipped into the lounge and emerged once a moment later. Come on, then. Come and see Santa's grotto. Teddy allowed a thin smile to play over his lips at the sight of the Christmas tree. A white light reflected off the green ornaments. Sparkling purple, red, green, gold, tartan bows hung from the ends of branches. A little ornamental building was formed of tiny villages on the coffee table, palm which was draped a white runner, suggestive of a blanket of snow. Apertures within the village buildings allowed flickering light to escape from wind, creating a scene of cosy cottages and village church. Tiny ornamental villages wrapped in vintage dress, co- grouped as couples and choirs or, car- or carolers, vintage car or snow-covered telephone box. Made this scene complete. Oh, this is a lovely surprise, Teddy said. And don't worry about the little building. There's no candles in here. We found these great little flicker lights, and they fit in perfectly on the calc. Yeah, one calculator batteries, so no risk of a fire. Ah, said Teddy, said in wonder. So there's no excuse for not putting them on, right? Cow was it? I catch him. Teddy raised a bruised hand. And his battered forehead in a box of loot. So, what do you think? Well, I still think it's for children all this Christmas, Malarkey. But you've done a lovely job yet again, Elsie. Carol, oh, Carol, Dad. He fell asleep, Elsie. I don't want her to wake up. Wake her. Come and sit down, Dad, Carol said, leading, leading her father to his favourite chair. Just relax, it's Christmas Eve. I've got a nice bit of cottage pie for your dinner, and then tomorrow Pete's going to pick us up and take you to over to our house. And he frowned. This is our house, you daft woman. A rattling of spoons and mugs on the tea tray announced Peter's survival before he could be seen. Here we go, he said, setting the tray down at the end of the coffee table. Which one's mine, Sean, and which one's yours, Mum? Pete glanced at Carol, wide-eyed, showing the palms of the hands to her, the expression that said, What do I say to that? Carol calls something hit somewhere, hearing it. You should try to orientate people with dementia back to reality, possible, so that you remember, so, and so she reminded her father they, who they both were. Well, where's your mother? 
You don't remember what happened to Mum. It was eight years ago, Dad. Can't you remember? Teddy frowned and said, She died, didn't she? Sure. Shouldn't he have told her about the boy? What what are you on about, Dad? Clara glanced nervously at Pete. Teddy looked at Pete, his eyes narrowed with a sudden fury. You shouldn't have told your mother about that boy, you little bastard. Teddy, it's me. It's Peter. I know who you are, you bastard. Teddy pressed his hands down in the arms of the chair, shuffling his backside closer to the edge, preparing to launch himself upright. You killed your mother, right? You should should never open a big... <laughs> what are about you? What are you on about, Dad? Carol glanced nervously at Pete. Pete looked at Pete. Teddy looked at Pete. And his eyes narrowed with a sudden fury. You shouldn't have told your mother about that, boy. You little bastard, Teddy. It's me. It's Pete. I know who you are, you bastard. Teddy pressed his hands down into the arms of the chair, shuffling his backside close to the edge, preparing to launch himself upright. You killed your mother, you're right. You shouldn't have opened your, your big, stupid mouth. You wouldn't have, and you wouldn't, wouldn't, and you wouldn't have worried her. Come on, Dad, calm down. That's not Sean. It's Pete, your son-in-law. My husband, you remember? Teddy frowned again, staring into Carol's eyes like a lost child. The pastor? Yes, Pete, the pastor. He's a good bloke. Teddy relaxed back into his chair. And smiled at Pete, calm down once, calm once more. You're a lovely, you're a lovely dad to those kids, Peter. Thanks, Teddy, Peter said, breathing a high huge sigh of relief. As he sat down, he reached for his first mother of tea. I'll be, I'll be, I'll get these here, Teddy said. It's one for you, and just, how do you like it? Carol sat back down at the sofa with a rest, with a rest of the arm. Almost touched the arm of the, her father, so he could be seen and heard, hear him more easily. Dad, do you think we need to talk about getting a bit of help for you now? I don't need a babysitter. I know you don't, Dad, but you, but you can remember what happened. What do you mean, what happened to the boy? To you, Dad, do you remember what, why you were in hospital? I had a bloody fall, didn't I? That's right, but I think you fell... Because you are very tired. I think your house is getting a bit much for you. You think I'm still drinking, don't you, Teddy? He growled. Come on out and say it. That's not it, Dad. I believe you. Not a drop in five years, Teddy announced. It's longer than that, Daddy. It's been eight years. You've done really well, haven't you? I didn't really, I don't know all these, need all these meetings. And that Alcoholics Anonymous did it by myself. I tipped the last battle down and sink and said goodbye. That was that. You did that. I pr- I'm proud of you. Ted, Pete then turned to the strange. He had spent his entire life in the house wondering if he could explore upstairs. He knew it was not impossible that someone could be up there. That he had made himself something unnatural was going on. It was not helped by Teddy's random outbursts about his dead wife. A boy had to admit the whole situation was creepy. Sometimes the old Teddy was sat in front of him, and sometimes it was like a different person wearing Teddy's clothes. Wearing Teddy's suit of clothes, a creak on the stairs caught his attention. He turned and stared at the lion's door. Did you hear that, Carol? Is someone in here again? Teddy asked. Again, Peter asked. Carol rested a protesting hand on her father's arm. Dad thought someone was in the house the other day before his accident. They were, all right. The boy was running around in here, playing tricks on me, moving things and locking the door. That's enough, Dad. I think we should finish these these covers and you come, come back to ours. Pete turned to... Carol turned to Pete and lowered her voice and said, Look, I'll stay with him. I'll be able to calm you down better than you can. Grab your... Could you grab the overnight bag and the package? Throw those clothes in there. 
into the laundry basket, and whatever you can take out, replace it with fresh. That will do him for a couple of days. Pete glanced at the loud door again. No problem. What's wrong, Pete? Carol asked. Is Dad's story spooking you out? No, don't be daft. Pete placed his mug down on the tray and stepped into the passage. He scooped up the navy blue cloth and leather overnight bag and switched on the stair and placed light. A bulb illuminated with not a second before. The light kicked off again, not the bulb. Peter muttered, he pressed the switch again, and the light returned. Oh, he said cheerfully, and he was he was three stairs, steps up before he realised. It was not the bulb up on, but when the light must have been switched off from the landing. Don't be bloody stupid, he thought. He pressed on up the stairs. On the landing, he heard his crunch and felt something... Not the bulb, Peter, Pete muttered. He reached, switch, pressed the switch again and the light returned. Oh, he said sharply. He was free his stairs, steps up before he realised that it, the bulb had blown when the light must have been switched off from the building. Don't bother, don't be bloody stupid, he thought. He pressed on up the stairs. On the landing, he heard a crunch and felt something small snap on the foot. He found the ferry from the top of the Christmas tree crushed with his, re- his left hand left leg twisted round his, at once don't be bloody stupid he thought he pressed up on the stairs on an ending he heard a crunch and he felt something snow caught small snap one foot he found the fairy from the top of the Christmas tree crushed, with his left arm and his leg twisted around at possible angles and sharp shards of plastic juttering out of the white gown. It was brilliant, he muttered. Like something else out about the Christmas in his house, ever since her um, mother died, the old one had sentimental value to Carol. He knew he was going to get it in the neck for this one. In the lounge, Carol placed the used mugs on the tray and said, Dad, I'm just going to wash these up, and then I think we uh, then I think we've uh, headed over to our house. I'm fine where I am. Teddy replied, "Dad, trust, just trust me. Do you have to spell it out? Do I have to spell it out, Carol? I won't want to leave. This is my home. I want to spend bloody Christmas in it with your mother. She, but she's out, Ted. A sleeping tear slid down to his cheek." She's not, Carol. She's not to me. I talk to her when I need someone to talk to. I don't want to to be in a ha- be at your house. You think I'm away, away, uh, away and simple. Just you think I'm talking to myself. I fancy she she can even hear me say, hear me still, still, Dad. Dad, don't, 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 Dad, me, Carol. Then he snapped, he shuffled forwards to the edge of his chair once more and rose to his feet on his shaking legs. He grabbed a picture of his wife from the mantelpiece. He's here, Carol. I need to, to be here, near her. It's nobody's business but mine what I do. Teddy stared at the Christmas tree and somehow the scent of a roasted turkey came to his nostrils. As he saw Elsie carrying, carrying baby Carol into the lounge and scores to a cowboy hat, Peeking over the top of the sofa, where he hid, he, he, ready to ambush his father with his name gun. Don't frighten the baby with that gun, Sean. Don't frighten your sister with it, Teddy said. Dad, I'm right here. Pete pushed up, opened the door, the door and immediately felt the temperature drop. Her hairs in his arms stood at end, desperately trying to retain his body warmth. A numb sensation tingled through his scalp, and it, f- it felt like a hand, but a hand constructed purely of static, pressing down on him, crying, stealing his energy, causing his legs to buckle. Carol, he said, Carol, get out of here. Carol heard Pete shout. He could not make, but could not make out the words. Just as her sister, she raced from the lounge, leaving her father to his uh, imaginings. 
bounding up the stairs, calling out for her husband. The broken fairy tree, tree fairy caught her attention for a second before. She rounded the noble post and stopped dead at her father's bedroom do- door. It took her brain a few seconds to register the particulars of the scene before, but certainly it was was that was Pete lay unconscious on the floor. What, when my struggle to reconcile was above her husband, a small black humanoid fi- figure, seemingly constructed of mist or smoke, stood with his legs apart of his body, position, struggling. I don't mind struggle to recognise that the air above her husband, a small black human shaped figure, seeming constructed of the smoke, stood with his legs apart over Pete's body in a posture suggesting victory over him. With each passing second, the figure's form dissipated, like drops of ink into rain, in rain, water, swirling and diluting until no trace remained. Carol clutched at her father's husband's side. Calling his name, shaking his shoulders at first at the first aid training she had forced upon her, her working at the supermarket, came back to her. She placed her ear to his mouth and immediately both felt that he had heard his breaths. Satisfied that Pete was going to survive, she maneuvered his right arm, leg, rolling him into the recovery position. She glanced up at the bedside cabinet. I saw the telephone there. She snatched it up and was about to dial 909 when the telephone rang. She answered the call. Carol recognized Sean's voice immediately. Listen, are you still at Dad's? Sean asked, his tone friendly and much calmer than his conversation that morning. Yeah, Tony. They said, so I, I will have to go. Something's happened to Pete. I can't explain it. Something very wrong going on here. Mm. She glanced at the bedroom cabinet and saw the telephone there. She snatched it up and about nine, to dial 999. When the phone rang, she answered the call. Carol recognised Sean's voice immediately. Listen, are you still at Dad? Sean asked, his tone friendly, much calmer than the conversation that morning. Yes, yeah, Sean, I have to go. Something's happened to Pete. I can't explain it. There's something really wrong going on in this house. I know. What? I know all about it. It's a boy, isn't it? What the hell? Just stay there. Don't go anywhere. I'm coming over. The line went dead. Carol checked Pete over once more. He seemed to be in deep sleep, so she pulled a dirty from her father's bed and draped over him. She made an unspoken promise to check on Pete every couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. She made an unspoken promise to check on Pete every couple of minutes. It seemed to be deteriorate. She could call for an ambulance immediately, whether Sean was there or not. Her father's cries from the lounge drove her back downstairs. Teddy stared at a tiny illuminated village and carved parts in the snow. He saw a tiny muddy boy twisted and bleeding for the vehicle. Crimson leaped into the white table runner, so that what so much blood for such a tiny body. Blood, blood. Oh, Dad, what's okay? wrong? She said. I had to have a drink with them. It was dead. It was dead. It was the, the, it was the, the thing. Back then, it was Christmas. I was a shop steward. I told them. I told you. Them. It was just one. Dad, what are you talking about? What happened? You asked to. They called you a queer if you didn't drink with them. Don't don't matter if you had a family or not. I wasn't having them call me that all every day. I told I told them just the one. They kept giving it and I'll get them in. 
but they had another round of, of a, It wasn't having them call me that every day. I told them just the other, just one. I'll get them, but they bought another round and over another one. Dad, what is it, this dad? Teddy seemed not to hear his daughter. His mind was elsewhere. Another time, another Christmas Eve. I only had to drive a mile and a half, I thought. Be all right. Dad, did you hurt someone? Carol said, asked, placing her hand on her father's shoulder. A front door opened and Sean strode into the lounge. You're all right, Dad. Let's, let's, let's get you upstairs to your bed. Wait a minute, Sean. He's telling me something. He needs a rest. The ramblings of a demented old man aren't worth the tr- time him being t- of the trouble of him being tired. Sean wrapped her arm around his father's shoulder, guiding him from the room. Where's Pete? He's upstairs. Doing something happened. He collapsed or something. He's in Dad's room. Okay. Well, we need him out of here. Go and see if you can wake him up, Sean suggested. Carol was hurried, Carol hurried upset, frustrated at Sean's up directing her father's story. What the hell, what are you doing here, Sean? Teddy asked. I came to help you, Dad, Sean replied. Mum will go mad if she knows you've come here playing pool. Don't give me that. I, you're here to get a sly drink. It was your age too, you know. I know all the tricks. They do that you do, Dad. Just just go you upstairs. You can have one drink with the old man, one drink for Christmas. Sean hurried his dad up the stairs and called it making him stumble. Come on, back up on your feet, Dad. He called up to Carol. How's he doing, Carol? Can't you get him moved? Just a bloody second, Sean. You're really throwing everything into stray here. I had it, this under control. He was t- trying to tell me something. Oh, it's upsetting him. I don't know exactly what it is. I know what's upsetting him. I tell, I tell you, but first, let's get him upstairs and tuck him into bed. At that moment, Sean's eyes fixed upon the broken fairy ornament. A pose looked so friendly. No, he cried. What is it? Carol asked, peering at the bedroom door. Sean shook his head as though it's trying to loosen the very the image is that come lodged in his mind's eye. Imagine the, the Christmas his, his father and mother had to the mother. Poor buggers, a poor little boy. I wish wouldn't have gone to prison now. I should, Uh, Sean hurried his father up the stairs, making him stumble. Come on, back up on your feet, Dad. He moved up, called up to Carol. How has he been doing, Carol? Can you hear him? Can you get him moved? Just a bloody second, Sean. You're really throwing everything to stray here. I had him, um, it's under him, it's under control. You're trying to tell me exactly what's upsetting him. I know exactly what it is. I know what's upsetting him, and I'll tell you. Just, but first, let him getting upstairs and tucked into bed. At that moment, Sean's eyes fixed upon the broken fairy woman. A pose looked so friendly. No, he cried. What is it? Carol asked, appearing at the bedroom door. Sean took, shook his head, so he's trying to loosen the three images that had been lodged into his mind's eye. Imagine the Christmas his and mother, father, mother, father, had. Teddy muttered, poor buggers. A poor little boy. I c- couldn't go to prison, though. It would have killed your mother. Sure, what the hell is he talking about? Why is he on about prison now? You're too young to remember, Crowell. There was a boy who lived a few streets from us. He ran over and killed on Christmas Eve. Carol's jaw dropped and he, she stared at her father's red teeth. 
face. Oh God, no, don't tell me. Don't tell me. That dad, Sean, and I did that. I am not even afraid so. Pete moaned and groaned, began to stir. Carol turned to him immediately, encouraging him back into a full consciousness and awareness. Pete, come on, let's get you set up. I should never have taken, given you a dr- that drink, Teddy said. I should uh, never encourage you to. That's okay, Dad. It was only a drink. I enjoyed having a drink with you, Sean said, patting his father's back. Carol's eyes narrowed in suspicion. She turned to see her brother and fa- father shuffling over the landing. Is everything all right with you, Dad? Pete muttered, rubbed his hands, both hands together, trying to clear an ice cold headache from deep within his skull. Oh, Sean's here. Hi, Pete. I just need to get Dad in the bed for rest. Could you come out here, please? Sean, why are you suddenly so concerned about him? Carol asked, a straw f- fixed, firmed. And her eyebrows knitted by her apprehension. It isn't fair, me leaving you, you to deal with him when he's going down the hill like this. If if it's for you, not him, Carol. Not why you don't. What now? But now, now, why don't you go and put the kettle on? And I'll tell you all about it when I come out. Come on, Pete said, encouraging. Go away. With, away from the bedside. Teddy flopped into the bed and Sean helped him to settle into position, propping his head up to a pillow. He spread the duvet over his father's body and sat by his side. He shrugged off his coat and pulled out a long, narrow cardboard box he had kept hidden within the garment. Teddy stared at the ceiling, no longer seeing plaster and paper, like fittings in his mind. He stood staring at a book, dented well curb on it and the Bengal child shivering in the snow as his life ebbed away, blood bubbles bursting on his lip with every ragged situation from his pulsed lungs. Put away, put away, son, I said. Ah, Dad. Shh, Dad. Put away. Now listen to me. I'll tell your mother. I've up the car in the car park at the giant red lion. I'll t- tap the dent out tonight. Sean opened the covered box and began unwinding the clear plastic with film. Pink film. We can never tell anyone about it, this. Not you, not your mother, not anyone. You can only ever talk about it, about, to me about this. You'll both be in trouble, son, if anyone finds out. It's okay, Dad, Sean said, struggling his father that cheek. We'll keep it secret. Down in the land, Carol told Pete that she had put together from what she heard. I bet there's been a drink where's when the drink is up. I bet that's when he started to get handy with m- Mum. I guess so. It's okay, Dad, Sean said, stroking his bad streak. We can keep it secret. Down in the lounge, Pete told Carol told Pete that she put together from what they, she heard so far. I bet that's when the drinking started. I bet that's when he started to get handy with Mum. It makes sense, but I can't believe old Ted would do that, hit and run. He's such an honest bloke, or oh, sorry, fault. He was run drinking, Pete. He was obviously went to keep himself out of prison. The poor little boy, his family, can you imagine that, Pete? It's terrible, Carol. It doesn't have bare thinking about, does it? Christmas Eve, Pete, the little boy's parents would have been waiting for him to come home and, and his presents would have been wrapped up, ready to go under the tree. He'd probably be running home to hang his stocking up. And maybe he stepped out into the road, or Dad was driving too fast, or he was too drunk to hit the brakes in time. And bang! He's gone, he whispered. I think I have to call the police, Pete. I think the truth has to come out. His parents would, should be alive. They should have the answers to, to what happened. Let's wait and see what Sean has to say, eh? Huh? Teddy clawed at the plastic 
Sean gently moved his hands away, not wishing to leave a mark in his father's arms, if he could help it. But since his arms were covered in marks, the falls anyway, he was not too concerned if he had to be, get more thoughtful. Shh, Dad, just give, it, give in now. He whispered, unsure his father would hear him through all the layers of clean film wrapped around and around his head. Don't take long now. Carol called, called from the top of the stairs. Everything all right up there, Sean? Yeah, just getting a little hot heart, sis. I'll be down in a few minutes. Those minutes seemed to come in eternity to his father, trembled and buckled, desperate to receive breath. Sean repeated over and over. He smoothed his eyes. Shh. I think I called the police, Pete. I think the truth has to come out. His parents could still be alive. They should have a bit, should have the answers what happened. Let's wait to see what Sean has to say, huh? Teddy clawed the plastic, fiddly moved his hands away, not wanting to leave a mark in his father's arms. He said to help, if he could help it. But since his arms were covered, his uh, marks were full away. He was too concerned if he had to be, get more forceful. Shh, Dad, just give in now. He whispered, unsure his father could hear him from all the layers of Greenfield, wrapped around and round his head. Won't take long now. Carol called from the foot of the stairs. Everything all right there, Sean? Yeah, we're just having a little heart to heart, sis. I'll be down in a few minutes. Those minutes seemed to be an eternity as his father's trembled and buckled, desperate to relieve breath. 
Sean repeated it over and over again in smoothly tones. Shh! Almost there. When his father lay still, Sean carefully unraveled the flame film, stuffed it into his coat pocket, concealing it with the original bag, and rolled within the garment to hide it when it went downstairs. He carefully and methodically checked his father's fingernails, all traces of skin or, pla- or plastic, but found he had done a good job of keeping his hands away, prying, prying his father's lips apart. He peeled at them some tra- tiny traces of plastic, from between his dentures, there had been no attempt to gnaw a hole for the green film. No breaks or bruises, a job well done. He stared back down, down at the face of the man who had been made him keep a terrible secret all his life so many times as a child. Sean had wanted to tell the truth, just as so he could believe himself for the weight relieve himself of the weight on his chest, hoping perhaps it would stop his dad from drinking and stop him from hurting mum. Eventually, he accepted the secret and hiding to the were to be part of his life forever, just just so, as they dominated his father's existence. But I mentioned that presented a problem. The old man could no longer be trusted to keep a secret. He was gone, better off gone. Sean stepped up, up to the bedroom and stopped on the consider the tiny mangled ornament at the top of the stairs, fingers in static perpetual. With pain in his skull, he was there again in the snow. His far, drunk father beside him, Sean, could feel the steering wheel in his hand, a buzz from the half pint of beer. His da- dad had allowed him to drive. He could hear the laughter his dad gave him, a rush driving lesson that gave him just enough information to carry him to the warmth of their home. Then he heard a screech of tyres, felt the sickening sensation of the wheel. Car wheels sliding off the ice and snow, and the climbing bump of the little boy been out seeing carols with his friends crunched under wheels. Bump, 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 again, bump, 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 again, bump, 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 bump crash. Carol and Pete burst out of the lounge to the bottom of the stairs where Sean lay motionless. His left leg and arm and leg twisted to impossible angles, his head split wide open, a dark crimson stain leaking across the floor. Carol screamed and Pete tried to pull her away from the scene. Had Carol just looked up the stairs, she would have seen two faces, one of them one of them most familiar. Her mum stood hand in hand with a pale little boy. He smiled, seeing the end of this terrible secret that had overshadowed every Christmas in the home for years, a secret which had killed a little boy by her side, and which at a time stilled her own heartbeat. The spirits faded, no longer tethered to the world around them, no longer weighed down by grief, no longer bound by the guilt of habit, living free to move on the realm beyond the physical, to the warm embrace of a heavenly peace.